Hello, uh, good evening and welcome. I'm David Wood from the Pacific Science Centre and I'll be your host for tonight's Science in the City live stream. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, again, I'm coming to you live from my bedroom here in Seattle. We're still fairly new to all this, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate you. Before we start tonight's lecture, I'd like to share a few bits of information with you. We've uploaded some of our past Science in the City talks, including our cannabis theme talk on 420, titled, What Are You Smoking? Demystifying Cannabis Regulations in Testing. That was with our friends over at Confidence Analytics. We also have our Earth Day talk titled, Earth Day Now More Than Ever, Into Nature and Toward Life. That was with Dr. Peter Kahn. So those past talks plus a number of others can be found on the Science in the City tab on the Paxi YouTube page. Obviously check those out after tonight's event. We've got some excellent upcoming Science in the City talks for you too. We're gonna to try and bring those to you every Tuesday at 7 p.m. right here on Paxi's YouTube channel. Upcoming topics include neuroscience with Dr. Atom Lesiak and they're one of our science communication fellows. We'll be talking about war and conflict in space with Dr. Sadia Pekanen, who is the co-founder of the University of Washington Space and Policy Research Center. We'll be talking about murder hornets. Uh, that's right, as if 2020 hasn't been hellish enough. We'll be talking to Dr. Chris Looney, who's an entomologist at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. They also had a great article uh, in which they were quoted in the New York Times recently. We'll be talking about urban coyotes. There's been some pretty unusual uh, animal behavior, thanks to the lack of behavior from humans because of social isolation. We'll be talking to Dr. Chris Shell about that, who's an urban ecologist at the University of Washington, Tacoma. And finally, in a few weeks time, we'll be talking about nature filmmaking with Kevin Campion from Deep Green Wilderness, where we'll be discussing their documentary, The Unknown Sea, A Voyage on the Salish. So to stay in the loop about upcoming Science in the City talks, or to stay connected with local scientists and experts, you can sign up for our e-newsletter at packside.org forward slash SITC for Science in the City. That's our e-newsletter. We won't bombard you at packside.org forward slash SITC. Educational programming like this is made possible in part thanks to the generous support of donors. In the face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public are absolutely essential. So to help us ensure that curiosity never closes or just for more information about donating to the Pacific Science Center, visit paxi.org forward slash support. Okay, well, finally on to tonight's event. You know, the big question is, are robots coming to a restaurant near you? Well, tonight we'll learn how robotics, artificial intelligence, and new restaurant models are working together to address challenges in the restaurant industry. Uh, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced thousands of restaurants to close but many would argue that the underlying challenges of food services uh, have strained the industry for years. From social distancing and hygiene to consistency, food waste, efficiency, robotics may help restaurants rise to the challenge. So who better to discuss this than Clayton Wood, who is the CEO of Picnic. That's a local Seattle startup. Um, they've developed a pizza assembly robot. Their platform uh, can produce over 300 pizzas an hour, which is just phenomenal, uh, and was recently put to the test feeding the masses at the Consumer Electronics Show, that CES, earlier this year, I think in January in Las Vegas. Uh, so tonight, Clayton will discuss how technology is poised to revolutionize the restaurant industry. As ever, please leave your comments, um, your thoughts, maybe you wanna share a story or just let us know how you're doing today. Leave all that below in the YouTube comments section. We'll try and get through as many of those as we can during the Q&A following Clayton's presentation. Uh, so without further ado, sit back, relax. I know I'm gonna enjoy a nice, uh, a nice slice of pizza uh, for tonight's presentation. So please welcome to the live stream, Clayton Wood. Clayton, welcome, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, David. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Excellent. All right. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, robot pizza, which is uh, always an interesting topic. 
And uh, let me share my screen here. And there we go. Um, pizza robots and restaurants of the future. So um, first a little bit about Picnic. Uh, Picnic is a st Seattle startup. We were founded in uh, 2016 and our focus is food preparation automation. Uh, we've started by, as David said, building a pizza robot. Our pizza system assembles ready to cook pizzas at a rate of 300 per hour. That's uh, 300 uh, pizzas that are customized, each one uh, customized size, shape, and toppings. Uh, so it's a, it's a unique system, nothing else like it in the world. And we came out of stealth last October and we uh, launched publicly at uh, T-Mobile Park last September in baseball season. And then we uh, were still there during Enchant, the uh, winter carnival event, uh, November and December. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we have gotten a lot of recognition since we launched. Uh, we were at, at CES and uh, remarkable thing about CES, we were there not as an exhibitor, but we were there as a vendor supporting our customer actually selling pizza on the, on the event floor, uh, but we were named to two different best of CES lists, despite not even being an exhibitor. Uh, we won the Food Service Robotics Pioneer Award at the Hospitality Innovation Planet event in Madrid this past February. And we're currently a nominee for Best Hardware Innovation, the 2020 GeekWire Awards. Those, the voting is still open there. So if you like what you see there, uh, please uh, get your vote in at GeekWire. Uh, we'd love to have your support. Uh, to just give you a flavor for what our system does, I'll, I'll give you a taste of that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about restaurants. So I've got a little video clip here uh, from CES uh, that I think you may enjoy. Hey, Clayton, we're, uh, we're not seeing your, uh, your presentation. Can we try the share screen oh. one more time? Okay. Yep. Let me go back. Pardon me. Okay, let's try that again. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Let's see here. And we'll try this again. Okay. Here we go. How's that? Uh, I'm still not seeing it, unfortunately. Should we, uh, should we give it one more try? Okay, once more with feeling. once again I think we I think we're in I think we're in business are you okay you got it yep all right Excellent. The screen now. all right perfect thanks sorry about that all right now we'll uh, we'll go to that video clip
All right, so that gives you a little flavor for what our system does and uh, how much attention we got. Uh, but let's shift this a little bit. We'll come back to that. Uh, just want to talk about what's going on with food service. Uh, recent weeks, uh, we've seen the restaurant world turn upside down. Uh, lots of restaurants are closed, sometimes permanently. Those that are open are only doing delivery or carry out. Um, just the most amazing, terrible, tragic uh, turn of events you can imagine. Um, and uh, but so that the restaurant operators that are going to survive are having to cope with a tremendous amount of change very quickly. Um, but what's interesting about this is a lot of the changes that are happening now actually were already uh, in progress before the pandemic happened. It's just happening all very quickly. Uh, this is a quote from Restaurant Dive, uh, a restaurant industry website. Uh, if you'll note, um, talking about virtual kitchens, popping up delivery only, no front of house, no dining room. But this, this was from January 2019. So a full year before the pandemic, these, these trends were already happening. Restaurants were already coping with uh, trying to, to figure out how to address uh, con changing consumer tastes. So a little bit of a before and after. Um, before customers demanding delivery, this was, this was requiring restaurants to deal in some cases with additional demand. Um, more meals had to be made. They had to be packaged for delivery so that they would end up uh, edible and delicious when they got to the destination. Um, but it was an additional supplemental demand uh, to what, what they were seeing. They were also trying to serve their restaurants in the dining room. Now we see nothing but delivery and carry out. So that's an even bigger change. Now, those that were laggards, they've got no choice. They have to package their food for delivery or for carry out. Um, and uh, they're still dealing with the same uh, cost burdens of the delivery services uh, some of which charge commissions up to 30%, um, hard to make money. Some restaurants before were treating delivery business as loss leaders. They would lose money on the delivery business, but it kept their brand out there um, and they, they still could make money on in-house uh, business. But now uh, that's no longer an option. So huge change. Next, labor. Labor before the pandemic, uh, the, there was actually a, a huge labor shortage. Globally, uh, labor shortage in food service, 150% turnover, uh, meaning basically every job that you had in your, in your restaurant was turning over two or three times a year. And you had to train new workers, hard to find people, always working short staffed. Um, and it's very costly uh, to operate a restaurant. Uh, and so very thin margins, big problem. Well, now we have a different labor problem. Now the problem is there's plenty of labor available, too much labor available, but you can't work the way these guys in this picture are working anymore. You've got to have social distancing. You can't have people working side by side, um, provides way too much transmissibility for disease. Um, consumers are afraid about uh, food safety. Even if the restaurants are operating very hygienically and using all kinds of protections, Consumers are still worried, and so they're staying away. Um, and so if you're operating a restaurant, you've got to be able to convince uh, your customers that you're running a safe operation and it's safe to eat the food. And finally, cost. Unfortunately, the cost hasn't gone anywhere. It's still a costly uh, to operate with lots of labor. And so these restaurants that were already struggling uh, with, with burdens now have reduced business, new restrictions, and it's even harder to operate a restaurant. Um, ghost kitchens uh, are a, uh, an idea where you have a commissary kitchen that is built just to produce food for delivery and carry out primary for, primarily for delivery. Uh, they've started to become popular last year. Uh, some big startups have started to do it on spec, building out uh, big tenancies where you can go and rent a space in a, in a ghost kitchen and Virtual restaurants were happening where you had uh, people cooking a different set of meals inside an existing kitchen just for delivery. Again, uh, that was happening all last year. Um, now you still have ghost kitchens, you still have virtual restaurants. Now you have retailers selling prepared food. You have uh, grocery stores selling prepared food. And now you've got a, this new idea 
a grocerant. Who ever heard of a grocerant? A grocerant is basically it, there's two flavors of it. You've got restaurants; they're selling groceries. There's you can get your staples at the restaurant because they're looking for additional sources of of revenue, and you can also get your prepared food in the grocery store. You can also get your prepared food in a convenience store. So what's happening is the entire concept of the traditional restaurant where you go in, you order off a menu, you sit down in a dining room and you eat a meal. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. There's no dining rooms to go sit in and enjoy a meal. So if you're going to go and pick up food and take it away, why go to a restaurant? If you can get it at the grocery store or the convenience store, or you can have it delivered. And do you really care if it's delivered out of the original restaurant or a ghost kitchen or a grocery? So the entire model of food production and fulfillment uh, has completely been blown up. It was in the process of blowing up. Now it's blown up overnight. So what are restaurants to do? Um, they, the, the proactive ones, the ones that will be successful are taking the initiative to reinvent themselves, uh, to become a grocerant, to sell other foods, to, to take on tenants, to uh, think about how will people consume their food in the future? How does it need to be cooked? How does it need to be packaged? What is the menu gonna look like? How can we how can we do this? Sometimes they're selling meals that need some finishing at home. Sometimes they're selling meals that are ready to eat. Sometimes they're packaged as they're plated. Sometimes they're packaged they need to be assembled. Um, the entire uh, thing's blown up. So, what what should restaurant owners do, and what can consumers expect? Um, and so, let's take take a step back and talk a little bit about automation um, and how auto, where automation is gonna play a role in this. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what it, the automation I know best, which is pizza. Um, why, why automate pizza? Uh, automate, pizza is a food that's very popular worldwide. So uh, it's a great place to start. It's also hard to make uh, automatically because it takes a lot of manual labor, uh, but that manual labor is tedious. It's easy to get it wrong. And uh, the number one uh, reason that we've found with customers why they are interested in automation is for consistency. It's hard to get workers to make the same pizza twice. It's hard to get them to not waste food. Uh, there's a number of, of uh, issues that pizza restaurants have with manual labor. Uh, one, food waste. Uh, cheese is the most expensive ingredient on a pizza. Uh, cheese gets spilled, uh, as you see here. It also gets overtopped. You, if you put too much cheese on the pizza, this is a classic mistake of the novice pizza maker. Cheese is delicious. More cheese is better. I like cheese, put more cheese on. Then you end up with a pizza that looks like this and it's, it's inedible. It's not the pizza that was designed in the test kitchen. It's not the recipe. Um, it's kind of terrible. Um, and it's expensive because that there's so much cheese on there. There's, a, there's no way the restaurant's gonna make any money uh, with, a cheese, with a pizza like that. Next problem is, is scheduling. Um, uh, pizza is, is great when it's got great ingredients and it's fresh and it's hot. Uh, but if you go into a busy restaurant at mealtime, the only way that you can have a fresh hot pizza is if there's lots of people making the pizza during a very short period of time during that rush hour. If, you, uh, if you're the restaurant operator and you don't wanna do that, some people make it ahead then they warm it up. That's not as good. Uh, I know at stadiums, sometimes they make the pizza days ahead and then they just warm it up on the day of the game. Uh, that's not so good. Or you may have to wait 30 or 40 minutes for your pizza. That's not great if you're in a hurry. So um, there's lots of issues with uh, the way pizza is made that makes it an ideal uh, place for automation. This is a picture of our uh, prototype uh, pizza robot. This is the system that we installed at T-Mobile Park. Uh, it's modular, as you can see, there are different uh, elements of it that perform different operations. Uh, going from left to right, uh, the first part is what we call the ingress module where uh, computer vision reads the size and shape of the pizza dough. So you can put in different sizes and shapes and then it travels along the conveyor there after about two seconds. And each module, there are little boxes on top. Uh, first one puts on sauce, then cheese, Next one, fresh slices, pepperoni off of the stick. And the last one puts on uh, granular toppings, sausage, fresh vegetables, 
mushrooms. Um, if you have an extensive menu, you can add more modules. You can have as many modules as you want. And uh, it, it takes about a minute for the pizza to travel uh, the length of that, which is about the same amount of time as a, as a skilled operator can make one. The difference is that by the time the first pizza is made after about a minute, there's five more pizzas in line, uh, another pizza coming down the line about 10 to 15 seconds behind the one uh, before it. So um, that's where the volume comes from. And it goes in, it's a, it's a ready to cook pizza. It goes into the oven. We don't make the oven, uh, but uh, we just make the pizza. So um, it's been very popular. We've gotten interest from all over the world uh, since we uh, announced this in October and uh, showed this at CES. So let's look specifically at some of the specific features that, that make this interesting uh, for a restaurant operator. Um, it's, as I said, fully configurable. Uh, because it's modular, it fits into any kitchen without remodeling. Uh, you can do any recipe. We, we can configure it to handle any food. And that's, we tell our operators that we will make your pizza. We'll make your recipe. You don't have to make a special uh, pizza with special ingredients that only the robot can make. We'll make your pizza high volume, full pizza uh, customization for each pizza, as I said. Um, low labor requirements. This is a picture of the executive chef at CES. Um, this is a man in the, in, in the process of making 150 pizzas a day. He doesn't look very busy. Um, it's very easy to use. And uh, he could have made 500 pizzas that day and he wouldn't have been a lot busier than that. Um, our system also requires no capital investment. We deploy something called robotics as a service. So if you're a struggling restaurant operator, you can uh, use our system for a monthly fee. Um, and it's, it should be less than the amount of money you can make using the system and save in food waste and uh, other operating costs. And so um, you don't have to spend a lot of money up front. Uh, consistent quality. This is the, as again, the, the number one thing we heard from customers. And we can also optimize inventory. We know exactly how many ingredients are being used. Uh, and so you don't overbuy the wrong ingredients. Uh, this is an interesting uh, feature of it. Uh, this is a, a gentleman named Paul Lane. He's a disabled journalist and accessibility advocate. Uh, we met him at CES one day. 10 minutes later, we trained him how to use the system and he made a pizza. He's a quadriplegic, limited use of his arms, uh, but he was able to make a, uh, that pizza and enjoy it. Uh, first pizza he had ever made. Uh, it was great fun meeting Paul. Um, less than 1% food waste. A typical uh, pizza restaurant has about 10% food waste. So significant cost and significant environmental impact. Uh, for a typical restaurant to do 250 pizzas a day, uh, that uh, Im environmental impact uh, adds up to about eight to 10 cars on the road is how much environmental impact is of the food that's wasted uh, between 10% and 1% uh, in a pizza restaurant. And finally, we can personalize for dietary preferences, um, uh, vegan, keto, choose your dietary preference. Uh, the system can, can um, make any, any pizza you want, depending on what ingredients are loaded. So uh, I mentioned that we were at uh, T-Mobile Park in the fall and uh, we did the Enchant event. It's a winter carnival. Uh, we were there for five weeks, 275,000 attendees over the time. Uh, our system made all the pizza for the entire stadium, 1,900 pizzas. We had one pizza maker uh, and, and did all of that with, with one person. Obviously that gentleman was socially distanced, um, but was able to produce a lot of food for a lot of people with a very reasonable cost and uh, very hygienic. So uh, this is the advantage of automation. So uh, this is our, this is a first look at our uh, 2020 version uh, will be released this summer, uh, cleaner, easier to use. Uh, you can see everything operating. It's a front of house attraction. So um, this kind of automation, which is affordable, effective, um, and can help operators uh, operate in this time where you're trying to have, uh, not have a whole bunch of people standing next to each other uh, producing pizza, uh, but can help them uh, operate and make some money and get back on their feet 
where they can hire workers to do other jobs other than making pizza. I mean, it's not, you still need workers to make pizza. You just don't need as many, but you still, you, uh, if you're operating, uh, that's how you're going to create jobs. So in conclusion, just want to go through the, the benefits of automation in a post COVID world. Uh, why automation first hygiene, zero contact food preparation. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of hygienic operations out there, restaurants that are very safe in terms of the way their workers handle the food, but there's still an underlying concern that people have. And if people are concerned about your food, they're not going to come and buy your food and it's going to be very hard to stay in business. So if you can signal that I have a way of, of keeping my food safer, then uh, that's going to make you more successful. Operating cost reduction, uh, running a business, running a restaurant, is always a low margin business. So operators are looking for any advantage they can get in a world where uh, they have to struggle and change and spend money on how they're operating and they have lower, uh, lower volumes. Uh, they're looking for any operating cost reduction they can have. And this can be, this can be the thing that enables them to stay open. Um, reduce food waste, we talked about that. 90% uh, reduction there. Digitization, we're digitizing what has been a fully manual process up to now. And so you can, you can tie this into your inventories. Um, how much food do you buy? A remarkable amount of food is wasted. It spoils actually in the cooler because it was overbought because they didn't know how many uh, meals they're gonna make. They didn't know how much inventory they were using. Uh, consistency, if you have inconsistent uh, production because you've got new workers, uh, you don't have a brand identity. If you go to the same branded pizza restaurant, you order the same pizza, you expect to get exactly the same pizza. But if you've got a new worker who doesn't make it according to the recipe, then you're going to end up with, uh, you, why, why go to a branded restaurant if you don't get what you're expecting? And finally, the personalization. So uh, in conclusion, I would just say that, you know, the, the restaurant industry has taken a terrible blow and there's some parts of it that won't recover. Uh, but uh, the operators that will recover are, are working on innovations, uh, figuring out what else they can sell. They're figuring out how to transform themselves, uh, how to uh, produce food quickly and cost effectively, how to get themselves on their feet so they can rehire uh, a staff and uh, thrive in a post-COVID world. And because I, I think, you know, this world, the rules that we're living by now are going to persist for a very long time. Uh, even after the danger passes, the, the effects will linger. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I will conclude and uh, turn it back over to David. Yeah. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, we, we really appreciate that presentation. Um, I definitely, uh, when I saw that cheese pizza, I definitely, <laughs> definitely looked like something I would make. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone who's tuning in. If, if you've got questions, uh, again, questions, comments, stories, please leave all of that below in the YouTube comment section. And we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, we have had some, some, some submitted questions on, on Instagram and, and by email. So I'll start with a couple of those. Um, what what can and we'll you know I think obviously with with COVID nineteen obviously that's 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 what everyone's talking about these days. Um, so what concerns have you been hearing from from restaurants during the pandemic? And you, you may have touched on that a bit before, but could you could you speak to that? Um, I think what we're seeing, um, and we've we've seen more of it uh, just in the last few weeks. It's interesting. I think uh, the first thing we saw was uh, some of our our customers just shut down. You know, at the, at the stadium, there's no baseball. There's no, there's no pizza at the stadium because there's no fans because there's no baseball. So that's just completely shut down. Uh, other uh, pizzerias, you know, their business is way off. Uh, but what we're seeing in the last few weeks is sort of a, a turning a corner, a pivot to problem solving. And we see more interest as people are realizing, okay, this is going to persist. We need to shift and figure out how we're going to operate. Um, talk to one major operator who is a uh, airport food and beverage company. And they went from being a multi-billion dollar corporation to zero revenue overnight because there's nobody in the airports. Uh, but they recognize that uh, this is an opportunity to retrench and reinvent themselves. And they want to come back with a more digitized, uh, more automated 
capability more more robust really uh, so they're able to withstand future changes so that's a, that's one thing we're seeing but we're also seeing people just worried about how do I you know even if I've got people who want to come and buy my food how do I how do I produce the food and protect my workers I think we're seeing businesses being really concerned because of news stories how do you keep the workers safe um, just being open isn't isn't enough if the workers can't operate safely. Thank you. I know, you know, you've been talking about, um, you know, the application of this technology at ballparks, um, at consumer expos. Um, is there much interest from, from smaller restaurant owners? How do, you, how do you sell maybe smaller restaurant owners on uh, the possibilities of AI? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we, we've seen tremendous interest from independent uh, operators uh, this technology is not only applicable to event centers and stadiums, it's also uh, independent pizzerias, chain restaurants, uh, corporate food service, campus food service, airports, grocery stores, convenience stores. Um, it just basically any place that, that pizza gets made. And it's, and it's, it's surprisingly cost effective, even down to a relatively low volume. We have a customer that we're working with now, his volume is off 60% uh, since the pandemic. Uh, but he still sees enough volume that, that this makes uh, cost-effective sense for him. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's applicable to all of, those, all of those customers. So are you seeing a, a dramatic reduction in, in costs, um, particularly for those, those smaller restaurants? Absolutely, yes. And so we, we generally uh, aim for our monthly fee uh, to be about half of the savings so that the operators are actually cash flow positive from using the system uh, through a combination of reduced waste, uh, better inventory control and reduced operating cost. Uh, there's significant savings that they can see. Gotcha. Um, we've got another question here. Are, are customers still willing to kind of pay, pay the same price for the products or, you know, and, and our restaurant owners, um, open to some of the tasks taken over by AI? I mean, is some of the magic lost? Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I, uh, there are some well-known uh, pizza executives who have said that, uh, that people order from large delivery pizza operations because of the magic of the pizza. Um, I, I'm sort of skeptical about that part of it. Um, I think the magic of the pizza is in the ingredients. Uh, we don't make the ingredients. I think, you know, the, the way the dough is prepared, for instance, is, is you know, lots of recipes and, and there's a huge difference there. We don't prepare the dough. The dough is an input into our system. So all we're really doing is assembling the pizza. And we believe we can assemble a pizza uh, as well as anybody else. And in fact, better in terms of consistency. So um, we can make a gourmet pizza. We can make a stadium pizza. We can make a deep dish pizza. We can make a thin crust pizza. Um, and uh, all, we're, all our system is doing is assembling it. Um, and we don't think that, that, that there's too much magic in that part of it. We think the magic is in the recipe and the way it's cooked. Hey, yeah, so um, we're getting some great questions in, in from YouTube. They're starting to flow in. Please keep those coming. Um, you, you, you spoke earlier about why you chose pizza for automation. Um, did you have a next food in mind? What, what other arenas is this applicable for, do you think? Absolutely. We're, this is really a, plat, a food assembly platform. So... Uh, we'll be able to apply this to any food that gets assembled, uh, sandwiches, salads, bowls, tacos. Um, we, as a startup, we're resource constrained. So we've specifically chosen to focus on pizza. So we have not, we've, we've been tempted, but we have not tr even tried to put any of those other foods on our system, but we know exactly the same technology uh, can do that. If you can apply a sauce to a pizza dough, you can put mayonnaise and mustard on a bun, uh, for instance. Uh, so uh, that's that'll be next. Gotcha. Yeah. The next question I was going to ask you was: Are you interested in branching out? Uh, a, a viewer says, "I've seen things like food shopping robots. Uh, how do you feel? <laughs> how do you, how do you feel? Do you feel comfortable with with robots chopping things up? What are your thoughts on that?" <laughs> um, you know, we we're we're not chopping anything up at the moment. We're we're just assembling. But um, automation is going to take really big advances. Uh, it, again, it was already happening. It's going to accelerate because of the pandemic. And you're going to see automation in all kinds of places. And, and all robots are not created equal. So 
some people look at our system and they wouldn't say, oh, oh look, there's a robot. Um, and we used to just say automation, but people love talking about robots. So we say robot. And uh, when you say pizza and robot in the same sentence, that people really get interested. Oh, yeah. Well, we're <laughs> big fans of robots at Paxi. Um, so how is the robot cleaned and how often does it require cleaning? Um, so the, the food re uh, hoppers are refrigerated. So the food stays in safe conditions all day long. So typically you're, you're, you're wiping down uh, some of the external surfaces, but major cleaning is just a once a day operation, like with any restaurant operation. Um, takes about 15 minutes to clean it. Presumably you didn't just, uh, you didn't just create this machine and it was immediately cranking out 300 pizzas. <laughs> you know, did, have you had any, uh, have you had any, uh, any lessons learned or any, or any failures um, along the way? You know, are there any ingredients perhaps that are particularly <laughs> difficult to get through the system? Um, yeah, this is, um, I'd say the system you see there, I think of it as the third generation system. Uh, the first generation system was pretty primitive. We've got some interesting uh, internal videos of, of the initial system, you know, putting little little dots of sauce and, and uh, you know, pretty crude. And we, we made a tabletop version uh, about a year and a half ago that was our first version that we were able to demo for customers. And it's it's been consistently very popular with, with, with customer demos. And so this version we made specifically so that we could field test it in the stadium. Um, and it's it's a complex system. There's a lot of mechanical moving parts, as you can see, some pretty sophisticated controls uh, operating it and synchronizing all that operation with the moving food. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty tricky integration process. Uh, the new version that you saw a rendering of in, in the presentation there, that'll be released this summer uh, to our first commercial uh, installations. That one looked very exciting. I think I could uh, I could stare at that thing, make pizzas for a while. Uh, speaking about potentially difficult ingredients, uh, what are your thoughts on pineapple on a pizza? Does it belong? <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's a controversial topic. Uh, we we do use that as one of our interview questions when we're inter interviewing engineers. We like to find out who who likes pineapple on their pizza. It, it's a pretty polarizing topic. And Is that the wrong answer? Well, we don't filter anybody out if they like pineapple on their pizza, but we know that's somebody we should probably keep an eye out. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what does the interface look like for pizza customization? Um, how does the operator input the different ingredients, combinations? Is it, you know, using one of these or how is that working? Yeah, totally digital interface. So there's an iPad mounted near the system. It's, we also have, have a mobile app. So it totally, you just, you, you're selecting, uh, the, the pizza you want. And depending on the ingredients that are loaded for a particular uh, installation, you select which ingredients you want or a combination. You can also customize each ingredient uh, up or down if you want more or less. So one of the things that's unique and capable with automation is if you say, I like a pizza with heavy sauce and light sausage and extra onions, you can say that to a number of people who will make a pizza for you and you'll probably end up with a different pizza every time, even if you're asking the same person. If you do that with our system and you put in the same inputs, you can get exactly the same pizza each time. And so you can really get a, a, a combination that you like and you can save that combination and, and get it anytime you want. Gotcha. Um, got quite a long one here. This is from Marco who emailed us. Clearly robotics and automation are enabling forces for increasing opportunities for social distancing, uh, reducing the number of contact points and increasing the collective level of safety in our food ingredient and food preparation supply chains. He, he emailed all this without, without seeing the presentation yet. So he was not like- <laughs> That's good. I, I should have had him you know, write the script for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, can you please expand on how Pic Picnic uh, specifically contributes to increased food preparation safety? And have you, or do you have any quantifiable metrics to demonstrate the reduction in contact points in the supply chain? Um, what I would say is um, essentially each, each pizza is made um, without anyone touching uh, the food. The, the, the humans have to manipulate the food to load the machine, uh, but that can be done uh, with, with packaging, uh, you can put a bag of sauce in and never touch the sauce. You can pour 
ingredients in from a bag and never touch that bag. So it can come directly from the supplier, uh, from the walk-in, be mounted in the machine. The machine will uh, apply the ingredients to the pizza. And when the pizza comes out and it's, and it's ready to cook, uh, depending on the individual configuration, you can have it flow right into the oven uh, with no hands. And so literally you can have a, a completely contact-free pizza, um, which uh, pizza is a safe, relatively safe food anyway, because it goes through a, a, a kill zone in the oven, but uh, no one, you can set it up where no one will touch any of the ingredients. And that's, that's really unique. Yeah, pineapple is, uh, is proving polarizing in the comments. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got we've got a few questions. Um, how many ingredients can you load into the system? You know, is there is there a, is there a carrying capacity? What's how much is too much? Yeah, so um, the the configuration that we have right now um, it, that we showed in the video, that's about seven feet long and that can hold up to you can have multiple sauces. Uh, one cheese, one sliced meat, and then uh, up to six granular toppings. If you add two more modules, you could add 12 more uh, granular toppings. So it could be, you know, less than 10 feet long and have, uh, you know, 20, 20 ingredients plus, which is a, you know, a typical pizza restaurant with a full menu has uh, 20 to 25 ingredients. So um, it's really, there's really no practical limit. It's just a matter of how how much do you want to have? The size of the hoppers uh, is are sized where with a typical uh, range of, of pizza ordering and typical volume, hoppers might need to be replenished either at, at most uh, twice an hour if you're really operating at full speed, high volume, um, but typically, you know, less than once an hour. Sure. Uh, we still got time for a few more questions. Um, how you know given that the 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 robot can can kind of produce any recipe um how do you see brands differentiating themselves um again the the brands have their recipes all we're doing is enabling them to make those those recipes contact free and efficiently so we're not dictating the recipe um the brands can still have their their particular combination their particular brand of ingredients that they're using um, I know there was a story uh, a couple of years ago about a, a ghost kitchen in New York City that was selling three different brands of pizza. And the only difference in the pizzas was just the box. They were putting the same pizza in different boxes. Um, as a contrast, our system, you could make three different brands of pizza on the same machine if you had the ingredients loaded. And each, each pizza going down the line could be a different brand, totally different uh, toppings and sauce and, and dough and, and utterly unique uh, branded pizza which is why it would be so great for a ghost kitchen application where you could be serving multiple brands of uh, that are marketed uh, all off the same facility. And could you redefine what, what ghost kitchen is one more time? Certainly. A ghost kitchen is simply a commissary kitchen, a centralized kitchen that has no dining room, um, is only making food for delivery. And uh, so it's, it's also called a dark kitchen in some parts of the world. Uh, some people use some other terms, but it, the idea is that it's not a restaurant. It's just a kitchen that's making food for delivery. And that's, that's something that was on the rise last year. And I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about it because uh, many of the restaurants are uh, involuntarily becoming like ghost kitchens, um, where if you order the food online, um, it, may, it may not be made at the restaurant location that you're familiar with, it may be made at some other location uh, where it's where it's more efficient, uh, cheaper, or closer to you, uh, which which may be where the food food is actually made. Okay, we've got time for maybe uh, maybe two or three more questions. Um, although pizza pizza usually does go through the kill zone uh, while cooking, like like you were saying earlier, is there any refrigeration inside the system for things like the cheeses or the meats mm -hmm. or any of those kind of perishables? Yeah, all, all of the hoppers are fully refrigerated. So the food is kept at a, at a uh, food safe temperature uh, just as if it was in the refrigerator. And so it can, it can stay there all day. And, uh, and how is the dough processed? Is there any, uh, is there any room for, for crazy crusts? Is there 
cheese, <laughs> cheese cheesy crusts or uh Sure. So our system is what we call it. it, It's dough agnostic. Um, Dough dough is actually the input to our system. So um, we're sort of indifferent to what kind of dough you want to use. So you can use uh, gluten-free, you can use cauliflower, you can use thick uh, deep dish, any, any kind of dough you want. Uh, All we're doing is topping it. So uh, there's, that's, that's one of the reasons why we say that we're not, we're not engaged in the magic of, of pizza. You know, a lot of that is in these, uh, how long was it proofed? How many times was it proofed? That's that's all upstream of our system. We're just assembling pizzas. All right, and and finally, uh, Clayton, for you personally, have you got a favorite? Um, you know, I like a pizza with just about everything. So uh, I I like to get as many ingredients on as I can get. You're getting all twenty on there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, Clayton, thank you so much for for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. We love highlighting local innovators like Picnic. So it's been a real privilege to talk to you today. Thank you so much, David. It's really been a lot of fun. Thanks. you, And and thank you to everybody who's watching at home again. uh, And also thank you for all these thoughtful questions. Uh, We couldn't do it without you. Uh, We hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. Please give us your feedback by filling out a very short survey. I think it's only eight questions maybe two or three minutes tops. And the, and the link to that is below in the description. We really appreciate hearing everybody's feedback so we can continue to improve these live streamed events. Um, also, if you really did enjoy tonight's talk, we hope that you'll share this with the friends or family, pizza enthusiasts, anyone who might, who might enjoy it. Uh, and those will, you know, will have this saved on Paxi's YouTube channel for later. Please remember to subscribe to our e-newsletter and find out about more of these Science in the City talks as they come up. That's at paxi.org forward slash SITC. And of course, please remember to donate to Paxi and ensure that curiosity never closes at paxi.org forward slash support. So once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.